Hi, I'm your host, Anand J. Sukadia, and this is the Limitless One Podcast. Join me on this journey as I interview the most inspirational souls who are tapping into their limitless blueprint on a mental, physical, and spiritual level to thrive in uncertain times. If you feel you are so much more than just this body, just this life, and want to tap into your limitless potential, you're in the right place. Here we go, starseeds. Can sacred sex be the key to enlightenment? The ancient Egyptians and many other wise traditions believed to know so. Welcome to the Limitless One podcast. I am your host, Anand J. Sukadia. We're going to destroy the shame and taboos of sex and rise up the divine frequencies sex and intimacy can create in your life. Catherine Smilis is an intimacy therapist and nervous system specialist on a mission to improve the foundation of families. She defines intimacy as the experience of feeling truly seen, heard, and understood as your most authentic self. Her unwavering passion for relational energetics and the nervous system has allowed her to not only help individuals find greater happiness within themselves and their relationships, but to amplify their influence into the creation of a more healthy and nurturing home environment. Catherine is the founder of the Intimacy Academy, where she continues to build a space for individuals to experience deeper connection in all areas of their lives. Welcome to the Limitless One podcast, Catherine Smilis. How are you? I'm so good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So I was very, very lucky to spend a couple of days with you, actually like 11 days, and we were <laughs> in Egypt together. And uh, it was it was a pretty magical time. And I remember I met you, I think it was like a first day. We were like waiting like super early in the morning for buses. And I gave you like some supplements and some vitamins. I'm like, here, take this. You're like, I don't know if I need this, but I was like, no, just take it anyways. Um, But then, yeah, we got to know each other over the time and uh, you gave a talk on the ancients and sexual practices um, from, you know, these, these wise traditions in the past and how it kind of relates to what's going on in sexuality right now in culture and our individual lives. And um, it really got my, my wheels turning in my brain. How has life been since we've been back? Um, It's been crazy to just sit with the integration process, not really feel, I study the nervous system a lot. And I think a lot of people get stuck in like, okay, I learned this and I have to put it into practice or I have to do something with it immediately. And and so I've been trying to sit back and just allow the information to fully integrate into my system and see how my body feels, um, taking my time to just really explore all of the wisdom and all of the experiences that we had there because they were so profound and have drastically changed me in several ways, which I'm still unfolding, but all in good ways. Beautiful. Yeah. I just feel like uh, being back and during this, this, the, the time we were there and going into every temple and the pyramids, my DNA was just like lighting up. I just felt these like floods of like downloads and past lives and all these things coming through and it's going to take a little while to kind of digest all of the things that happened. But I really feel like it's digested anyways on a subconscious level and a spiritual level. I'm just consciously now becoming more aware of who I am and stepping more into my power, which uh, I feel so amazing about. Like I have no fears about anything in this world, this craziness, the chaos of what's going on right now. Uh, but yeah, I just feel so in alignment. And I know that, yeah, as long as we're living our our purpose and our passions, then what what really can uh, can pull us down? There's really nothing. The thing that really stuck out about your like f- witnessing you in the pyramids too, when you had this enlightening moment, when everyone was like toning around you and stuff, is that you were able to achieve this really specific practice of like the the lotus coming out of your head, right? Like you brought the energy all the way to your brain and you were like able to do that while we were there, which is part of the ancient sexual practice, which we'll talk about, I'm sure in this episode, but you were able to actually do that. And I'm so excited to know that or be able to communicate to people that it doesn't have to just be through sex is how you achieve this enlightened state um, 
it was achieved in a different way. So yeah, the sexual energy be, can it be achieved just through breath work or through, you know, through obviously through sex, but there's so many different ways. And, you know, we went through a lot of different things like Kundalini activation and, and breath work and all the, 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 the ways in which we did it. And actually it's funny because I knew that going into the the king's chamber from what i've heard from so many different people and listening to podcasts and things like that like when you go inside this chamber it can be a very life changing experience so i had that like thought or belief going into it and what i did was when i got i started getting up into the room in the in the king's chamber i started my breathwork practice so i was just doing like a lot of vigorous breathwork um, for maybe 10 minutes beforehand. And then I was like, maybe like, there was a few people before me that went inside the chamber. So I was doing my meditations and oming, but also doing breath work at the time. And then when it was my time to go in, I'm like, okay, I'm primed up. <laughs> like The energy is flowing. And then as soon as I got in there, I took one breath and boom, like all the, the energy started coming out of my you know perineum all the way up to my third eye and then out my crown. And then, yeah, I was physically moving my spine, my vertebrae, everything like the snake head, it was all coming out and uh, it was pretty fucking wild. So <laughs> it was a very, very magical, magical experience for me. Yeah. Alchemy. Love 100%. It. <laughs> <laughs> so Kat, to get an idea of the way that your mind thinks, tell us what does living a limitless life mean to you? I think that totally changed after Egypt. I think it's like viewing life through the idea and the lens that everything is possible and that with intention and concentrated attention, you can create any reality that you desire because we are all just emanations of each other. And so like you can hop into or connect with other people's timelines, connect to other people's stories because we're all part of this like unified field. So that is definitely a download that I got from Egypt for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've I noticed like every time somebody shared something, I'm like, oh wow, that's like a story in my life. And like you take all these stories, you put them together, and then you have yourself, right? That's that's kind of the way it was. So it just blew my mind every time talking to somebody, so many different backgrounds, but yet at the end of the day, we are all one. And that's what I really took away from this. Yeah. The experiences, the pyramids, all that stuff is beautiful, kundalini activations, but like just looking at you looking at all these other people looking in your eyes and seeing that soul and seeing a familiarity that was like so so powerful and a reminder that you can do this not just going on a trip with some really amazing people but you can do this and find the commonality and find the love and the soul in every single individual that you see obviously there's probably some people that don't have souls <laughs> <laughs> We won't, we won't go there. But um yeah, so it's 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 a daily reminder just looking at everybody as is if they're a mirror to you because uh yeah, you want to treat them the way that you want to be treated. Yeah, and and noticing in the people that you have resistance towards, if it's for instance like if some like a wealthy person and you look at them and you have judgment, seeing it as a re resistance to what you don't think is possible in your own life. So if you can switch that and you can change the way that you view them or relate to them, then you're also inviting that energy and that potential into your unified field as well. Yeah. So well said. The things that we resist the most, they can be our greatest teachers. That was great. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background. So I have been in the hospital system since I've been 16. I was a I always volunteered at the Rehab Institute in Chicago, which is like a very world-renowned rehab center. So I saw things from all over the world. I saw people, conditions, experiences, tragedy from all over. And so I had a very different view of healing and also death from a pretty young age. And then I knew I wanted to go into the healing arts. So I became a therapist. I've been practicing for five years. And I recently, well, it's been two years now, uh, left the hospital system completely because I realized that it's not a very healing place. We do healing very wrong. And um, in my five years of practice, I was also a traveling therapist. So I had been all over the country seeking, like, where do we do, he where is healing happening? And it was not happening in any of the places that I lived which is crazy to me. I'm like, oh, maybe Oregon. No, maybe Arizona. No, maybe, you know, uh, Nevada or Tennessee or Indiana or Illinois. Like nobody was really doing healing in the way that I inherently knew um, was possible. 
So I left the hospital system and I started my own practice off of the idea that the people who ended up being really sick in the hospital shared stories of feeling very disconnected, isolated, anxious, depressed in their life. And it always had to do with like how connected they were to others. I'm like, we're missing this intimacy education or relating to others throughout our life. Like people are just plowing through their lives and they don't have the ability or the skills or the tools or the knowledge to be able to foster really meaningful relationships, which leaves them in isolation. And then, you know, an inherent human need of all people is connection. So if you don't experience that, your soul is like, okay, bye. And that results in the physical manifestation of illness. So I was like, if I can create a curriculum, that's fun. And also enticing of like deeper intimacy and sex in your relationship, but you learn interpersonal relationship skills then you learn how to connect deeper with a stranger on a bus, somebody at work, like your spouse and yourself first and foremost. So that kind of uh, the process of unraveling the question why do people get so sick led me to how deep do you experience intimacy with yourself? And then how is that projected onto others in your life? Yeah, that's, that's so powerful. I really think for me personally, like a uh, human connection and love is like my, one of my highest values. I don't feel good when I'm just like uh, not connected to really amazing people. So like during the pandemic, we know that a lot of people were disconnected from their families and there was so much depression and, and suicide attempts and and all these kinds of things going on. And it was because everybody was separated or separated through technology and not physical touch, you know, just hugging somebody, you know, doing a heart to heart hug with somebody increases so many chemicals in the body that are like healing elements that, that you need. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So when, yeah, when we're disconnected, uh, then that's cortisol and that stress hormones, they take over more so and the feeling of longing or, or need, you know, needing some, some other person. And when we're totally disconnected, we, we disconnect from who we are at the, the, the truest selves, all these ancient cultures going back to when people were living in caves, they were all community based, you know? Mm -hmm. So nowadays it's a little bit harder to, you know, it's harder and easier because it's harder to 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 build a community in cities when everything is moving so fast paced. But also on the flip side, technology has made the ability to find your tribe a lot easier. And then what's it's up to you to decide how you want to go and, and build that community based on knowing you have amazing commonalities with, with others. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's even like um, I don't know if you've ever seen the study in psychology classes, but I think they're two or a capuchin monkey. And there it's uh, showing will people what what will people prior or what will um, animals energy prioritize? Will they prioritize comfort and connection or food? And in the study, the monkey, the little baby monkey actually chooses the robotic monkey mom that has a soft blanket for comfort and they don't prioritize the dish of food that's there. So we are inherently driven, motivated by comfort and connection. Wow. That makes me so sad that a, that a monkey is like seeking a robot for love and connection, no. <laughs> but it's, it's so true. We're wired to, to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And what got you interested in the topic of sex, particularly? Yeah, so my practice is more so focused on the intimacy piece, which is different than sex. So a big part of my mission is to help people separate that because everyone can figure out how to have sex, honestly. But the intimacy piece is how you stoke the fire. It's the mental, emotional connection of relationships. It's the interpersonal dynamics. It's being able to feel seen, heard, and understood as the person that you actually are, like your authentic self, which helps to improve the sexual experience. But it's the meat and potatoes of like what keeps relationships really nourished. Um, and like, you know, we don't ever talk about that. The, the mental, emotional side, lots of people are not comfortable exploring their emotions. So that leaves a repression in the energetic dynamic of the relationship. And then subconsciously, you start to resent your partner for not understanding where you're coming from. But if you don't understand where you're coming from, you don't spend time developing your mental, emotional understanding, 
you're always going to project frustrations out onto your partner because you're not exploring that or communicating that well to them. Yeah. So I was actually just thinking about this um, earlier before the podcast to to talk about this. So uh, the first thing I'll say is uh, for the audience, anytime we mention sex, it's we're talking about sexual energy in this podcast. So we're talking about intimacy, sexual energy, going from all your energy centers. So it's not just the root chakra of like, you know, having the sex, but it's, yeah, it's creational. It's going into your heart. It's going up to your pineal gland and then out. I mean, basically it's a, it's an entire field. So like when the sex is just stuck in the base, that's when we're only talking about the physical act. So just a little backdrop on that. Secondly, what you mentioned is so freaking powerful. And this is basically, let's break this down. So the, um, the way people feel in a relationship, say you're in a relationship and you have this certain need or desire, and then you have a couple of options, right? The first thing to do is to suppress it, right? We're suppressing that energy. We're not talking about it, but where's that energy going to go if it's suppressed? At some point, it's going to bottle out into maybe some really negative ways, or you find a practice on your own uh, where where you can move that energy, whether it's, you know, having an affair or whether it's, yeah, going into like some kind of kundalini breath or something like that, right? The second option is to talk to your partner and express it through the throat chakra and talk about your needs and your desires. Now, then your partner has the ability to say, okay, yes, I want to work towards uh, working with you in this. And then they share their desires. And then it becomes a situation where you're working towards a common goal. You feel heard and you uh, and they also feel like they want to bring more harmony, bring more peace and bring more love into the relationship. So yeah, my partner's desires are just as important as mine, right? And then the other option they have is just to dismiss it and to say, you know what? That doesn't really matter to me. You know, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's your problem. You deal with it. So this is, I mean, basically this is what's happening in so many relationships out there. So how would you kind of like, you know, how do you look at the situation? And then how do you like help other people figure that out and navigate when they're an individual or whether in their partnership, but the level of awareness with both people are maybe a little bit different? Yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of studying ancient Egyptian practices and also macro philosophy, so we live in kind of like a micro philosophy. We're very much in the granularity of situations, it's really hard for people to experience like a wider view of what you're in because we are sympathetic, mostly sympathetic dominant. So we're like in this fight or flight state, just being in this arena of so much stimulus, so many emotions, so much stuff happening. I think it puts us into like a narrow minded view of a much larger picture for what relationships have the capacity to do for you in your life. But both of these spectrums, so like macro philosophy or futuristic thinking, like where we're headed, and then ancient practices, we're kind of in the middle of that. But if you look at what those beliefs were, they saw relationships as a tool for ascension, um, an opportunity to determine if something is inherently like for you or not for your soul growth. So in ancient practices, they were like, they didn't really put an emphasis on you need to be in a relationship kind of like we do now. That's the end all be all. It was like, no, the relationship is to help you to expose obstacles to your ascension process. So they knew like, if this isn't your divine connection, divine union, or you're personally not at that space yet, you still have room to grow individually, then the relationships you call in are simply teachers for you. They're here to show you parts of yourself that you can't consciously see on your own, and they help you to ascend um, until you get to a space where you reach enlightenment on your own. And then you also, you know, like attract someone who is at that level. And then you use that relationship to then start to transcend your physical experience. So it's more of like an energetic relationship that helps you again, um, transcend the physical And in the macro perspective, they're like, relationships are so funny because we put such, we're like, want to hold on to your partner and you want it to be like a very, uh, you want to possess them. It's almost like a childlike view of this is my toy. This is my toy. I, I can't let this person get away from me. I can't let them be who they are or ascend above me or go side, whatever. Like, it's like, oh, you are in my little bubble. You stay right there. And I think that mentality that we have 
been indoctrinated in based off of religion. Like, I think it came from a good place, but then it turned into within the confines of this marriage that you put into this bubble and it has all these restrictions because of laws. It puts people into uh, like a cage. Um, Esther Perel has a book, it's called Mating in Captivity. And it talks about how basically we're like these zoo animals in captivity. And we put ourselves in all of these little boxes. And if you try to put an animal in a box, like they have a couple, they, initially they're going to try to get out, right? They're going to try to escape. And then eventually they become like very docile because they can't get out. So we're like these repressed animals that either uh, suppress things that we're feeling, or we have these emotional outbursts that look very irrational, but it's part of our innate human animalistic behavior. Um, that I think just like stunts the growth of where people could potentially, uh, how people could potentially use relationships to continue to evolve and ascend individually. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And I've experienced all of it, the, what you just described, right? In prior relationships, I realized every single one was trying to teach me the same lesson <laughs> is to love myself more and, you know, and to really truly fall in love with myself and honor myself as I would somebody else. And then now being in this relationship, I realize that, yeah, it's about ascension. So what is it? How can I lay the foundation of support for, for my partner to reach that ascension and become the very best version of herself? And, you know, her and I talked about unconditional love the other day, whereas like, you know, I love her to a point where I just want her to ascend the best way she she needs to and and ver vice versa. Like I want her to be able to, to do that. And I feel that way. That we 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 both want that for each other, and going back to the ancients, yeah, they they looked at it from because they knew that you know this this life is about obstacles, challenges, but then also the growth because without the the challenges, you don't get the the growth. So in the ancients' view, everything is uh you know there's no timelines, right? It's like there's not just like one little life that you live for maybe eighty years, ninety years, and you die. It's like your soul needs to ascend to to learn all the lessons that it needs to. So going into like, you know, the symbolism of especially ancient Egypt and relating to divine masculine, divine feminine, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've learned through your studies in it and what you've experienced actually in, in the trip that we went on? Yeah, I think um, it was so beautiful for me to see all of the images on the walls of different depictions of uh, the masculine and feminine, but it was so equal. Like they were, it was, it, they didn't have to say it. They didn't tell us what they were trying to communicate. We couldn't, we couldn't um, decipher the language on the wall, but the pictures that they showed of the masculine and feminine were so, they were embracing, they were feeding each other the onk of life. Like they were equal in size and shape. Like n there was not a gender that was smaller or lower. It was so equal. And you just like felt this radiating support and love and yeah, just like equal, equal love, equal uh, respect for each other written on the walls. And uh, one thing that I notice in my practice um, is that there's a lot of people right now focusing on polarity work, helping people to embody the masculine, embody the feminine, but they like are kind of missing a piece that's really important is regulating the nervous system and witnessing the pain that you've experienced so that you can naturally start to express your innate polarity. It's really hard to force yourself into being feminine if you don't feel safe in your own body, it's really hard to be a more masculine man if you feel like no one's ever witnessed your pain. It's it's almost you're putting yourself into more of a box by putting on a mask of like, OK, cool, I'm going to practice being more masculine, but I still have this other side of me that's never been seen. So. I think like if I'm working with a couple, um, I have them work individually first so they can really like siphon through their stuff, you know, and after they are seen and they're heard and they understand 
all of the ways in which, like you mentioned, I was attracting the same person that was trying to teach me the same lesson. If you don't have any awareness to that, you can continue, you continue on. And, and then you start to like mask, um, or it's difficult for you to really step into your masculine power. If that process or that, uh, awareness was never you never had that awareness, right? So if I'm working with a couple, I help them to individually understand themselves, move through the residual effects of whatever they've been through, and then bring them together in a session where they they honestly naturally start to embody like more of the masculine protector, the masculine energy, and, and the woman can like lay some of her uh, hyper-independence down, for, for example, And she starts to open up more to the man once she has this like, oh, I don't have to suppress the way that I'm feeling. I can trust myself. I know what that looks like. I know what that feels like. Then she can start to trust her partner, which when you start to trust the masculine, it just like, you know, fans his flame and he wants to show up more for the feminine. Yeah, it's it's so powerful. And it's it's so crazy because yeah, it's hard enough to do that on your own. But then when you swim into the waters of like, what's this going on in society right now, where there's so much confusion regarding all of it. And you know, if you know, somebody wants to be more masculine, but yeah, then masculine, uh, you know, ideals, or, you know, even divine masculine is being attacked as like, oh, that's misogynistic or, or whatever. So it's like, trying to na- navigate, not offend anybody, but then also being your own true self. And um, I think that, yeah, how do you focus on enlightenment and reaching a higher state if you feel that there's a lack within, you know, oneself? So I think the first step is really you have to find that that baseline within yourself where you do know that you are complete and then you can start building the blocks of what you want to create. And yeah, like you, you know, this this whole universe, it needs the masculine and the feminine, you know, like you were talking about in Dendera, like, oh, sorry, in um in the different temples. I particularly in Dendera was like one of the most magical places I've ever been to. I just felt like um like really divine feminine force there. But it was also it was so beautiful that it actually allowed me to step more into my my true masculine too. So, you know, that when you have the divine feminine, it actually embraces and it, it helps raise up the, the the masculine and then vice versa, you know, to be able to kind of play in this this joy of life and having the whole the whole spectrum of, of both energies is what we need. We don't need polarity, we need, you know, coming together. Yes. For sure. Dendera was also my favorite. It, I just went into it. I didn't follow the group around. I was just trying to sit in the feeling of it because that feeling is what I, what the, like the tone and the vibrational intention that I put into now my practice. Like when people come into my space, I try to just radiate the feeling that I had in that temple so that they can absorb that feeling. Yeah. So tell me, what did you uh, specifically feel in Dendera? But so by the way, for for those that don't know what Dendera is, is the temple of Hathor essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And um, my feeling is that, yeah, it was a, it was a temple constructed to divine goddess energies. And it was also a mystery school. um, So where they brought kids at the young as the age of like six or eight years old, those who they felt they could initiate properly and they became priests there, but it would be a very long time period for them to become a priesthood. But they would learn all the different, you know, modalities of mathematics, science, religion, you know, being a priest where they're performing ceremonies and all this kind of stuff, kind of like, uh, you know, the polymaths of these days, right? Like where, they, where they're learning everything and then they can go and, and teach other people. But um, that's one aspect. But then also the other aspect of this temple was like going in there is like a healing space. So when I went into each room, there was a very distinct feeling in all the different places. And one of the coolest things I saw was um, there was a little temple to the side of the main the main temple complex where you go in there and you just see this like doorway, but it's completely like sh- like there's no door there. It's just like presented as a door, but it's kind of like a stargate. So there was a lot of things happening in these places, and I don't think they did anything that was not intentional. So. It's really interesting to to be in this feeling, but yeah, I would love to hear about what your experience was when you were in there and what you were really tapping into. Yeah. So uh, just to expand on that theory is that Hathor, the goddess of Hathors, there's several, 
um, they had an instrument, it was called the Sistrum, and they would use the Sistrum to channel frequency from a different galaxy for healing. And so they believe that the Sistrum is either hidden there or they were able to channel the frequency and put it into the pillars that are in the front. So right when you step into the place, you are being exposed to 432 Hertz, which is an incredibly healing and retuning frequency. So you just feel that. And I believe uh, Muhammad was saying, our tour guide was saying um, that he doesn't believe a lot of stuff that's said. He's like always very skeptical about people's theories and stuff, but he's like, I, I cannot discount how much information we've received about this specific place in particular being incredibly healing. And also there is supposed to be a Zeta, Zeta machine, which is a time machine that is hidden there. So it's just like this intergalactic this station for healing, for travel, for just yeah, the feminine, it was mind blowing and so well kept. That was another thing that really blew my mind was like being there in Egypt made me really sad to see how the culture, like how they were living. I, I projected a lot of like, they must be so sad. They must be so miserable because it, they were, it was a poor country. There was like a lot of um, garbage around. It seemed like a lot of poverty. The houses that people lived in were basically falling down. And then amongst that, you have these magical temples that are pristine and so well taken care of. It was just mind blowing to see the contrast. Yeah, really. I mean, and even some of the original paint is like still on so many of these complexes. These are thousands of years old. Who knows how many thousands? But the you know the the version of reality that they they share is like it's you know anywhere from thirty five hundred to three hundred uh, thirty five hundred BC to three hundred twenty AD ish around there. Um, but it's it's crazy, right? Like you know, you're talking about this this uh, this time machine, this time warp travel you know, situation, it could be right behind the the Stargate that we see in that temple. You don't know what, what these powers hold, but there's something that's very sure is that there's a feeling when you, yeah. when you go in there. And I really like try to also separate a little bit and go on my own and not really be engaged in too much talking. Cause yeah, like I love talking to everybody, but I, I just felt like there was a mission for me to go there. And I think next time, yeah, just absorbing everything and maybe meditating and stuff like that. I wanted to see all the all the hieroglyphs because they're just so wild, like the crypts in the, in the basement and, and, you know, like there's no light or there was no like smut or smut like uh, found from like um, from lanterns or candles or anything like that on the ceilings. So was, how do they light these things up? Like what is going on here? It's, and I think that these, these temples were designed in such a way to inspire awe because they knew that they would last and they have so much love for humanity that they wanted to be like, yeah, this is what's possible. And it's no big deal. It's like, guys, we do this all the time and you should be doing the same thing. That's that's the feeling that I got going to yeah. this. So just my my view of being limitless has increased so much since uh since you know downloading all these uh ideas from that trip. Yeah, that's huge. That's how I felt too. It felt like they were trying to leave a manual in every place, like, oh, we'll just write all of the information from the floor all over the ceiling and they'll get it. <laughs> we're like, what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, I think they're QR codes. I, I don't think we need to consciously understand anything because uh, I was basically unzipping the files at night when I was dreaming. I was waking up in freaking night sweats when we were on the, the Nile cruise river, like every night for the first four or five nights, just massive night sweats. But I'd wake up and I'd be so happy. I was like, oh my goodness. I this this is like, this is what it's like to be on like, you know, mushrooms all day long, every day. <laughs> Wow, QR code. So you QR code them in with your eye and mm -hmm. you just bring them into your brain. Wow. Okay. I believe okay. so. So yeah, uh, you know, both eyes, right? Our visual eyes and our third eye. I believe that yeah, it's a transmission. Either we're getting a wirelessly or we're taking the snapshot of the QR codes. It's just being in there. You're you're absorbing the geometry, you're absorbing the energetics and all of the symbols. Um, yeah, whether you know it or not. I mean, I, that's that's the message that I got, at least. Yeah, thank you for that. That makes me feel a lot better about things that I thought I missed. Yeah, of course. And so, okay, so on the topic of the ancient sex, so like, what did they use sex for? I know there was a lot of reasons, like, you know, for, for enlightenment, 
for, for curing, manifestation, all that kind of stuff. So they knew that this energy was so powerful. So talk a little bit about, you know, what was your belief that they, why they, they spent so much time talking about this through their hieroglyphs and through their messaging? Yeah. I mean, sex, sexual energy is the most potent energy that we have access to in our own experience. And they knew that you could cultivate it, um, in, in various ways. And they, they didn't really teach the principles to people who are living in their lower three chakras. So it was like a secret, secret thing that they, um, they didn't talk about until people reached a certain level of initiation to where they could handle the potency of this energy. So, um, initiates would go through lots of training then to be handed down different ways that you could raise this energy first and foremost by yourself. So they always taught like you, this should be an individual practice. You do it through breath work, you do it through meditation, you raise these serpents that start in your um, pelvic floor or your root chakra. Like you can cultivate a lot of energy and you bring it up through your chakras into your brain. And then once this process happens. It's like really crazy to even talk about without giving you like images and all this stuff, but the two serpents raise, and then they get into your brain where your pineal and your pituitary gland actually connect and they create an explosion of chemicals, which is quote unquote enlightenment. And it like bathes all of your cells with this magical energy. And they knew that you could take the energy from this orgasmic experience that you have and channel it two things because we are creators. We create our reality, but we also create human life. And if you're not creating human life, you can use that same energy towards a goal. So there's lots of people who kind of like waste this energy because they don't understand what's happening. But again, if you're living in your lower three chakras, what you would actually manifest from that process is probably not good for the greater good because it's coming from a more like scarcity survival mode place. So again, they would like, they would wait to teach these principles, but truly you could use the energy that you're cultivating for healing. You can direct it towards healing in yourself. And if you have a partner, you can start to send energy to them through a practice called the microcosmic orbit. You send energy to them to help heal. You can use it to send out and manifest things to come back to you. Um, you can use it for creation. I mean, it's a process that you can really create any sort of reality that you want with this energy. Yeah, it's uh, this life force of ours is so powerful, both women and and men who are are engaged in these these higher realms. So, a couple things. So, like if a, if a person is masturbating all the time and just wasting their you know, their sperm and and all this kind of stuff, it's like they're not, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, right? So when you're, you're not using this energy towards something that's higher for yourself and higher for humanity, just like a simple base practice. Yeah. So the, the other part of it is like, okay, you know, that was a mystery kind of mystery school in ancient Egypt where they would only start teaching you when you're ready. Right. So like, where do you, where do you get to the point where you're, you're actually ready. And you know, the, the thought comes to my mind when the student is ready, the master will appear. So I kind of believe like right now we're in a mystery school right now with all the chaos and everything going on in the world is the people that are seeking those higher levels of awareness. They have to do, I mean, we had to do a lot of work in order to get to this place where we can all kind of like coincidentally synchronicity all find each other in the same same place and have these like amazing magical experiences it doesn't just happen where you wake up one day after being really like you know third eye closed and be like oh, okay i'm just gonna like go ahead and start learning about this stuff so you yeah. have to start mastering those those lower three chakras and then once you're ready i really believe like the clues are all out there, you know, when you look around in symbolism and, you know, the, the, the Masons and all this kind of stuff, the back of the dollar bill, they're showing you all these clues, but only for the initiates who are ready that you can start now understanding the awareness where it opens up a second la layer, a second level of life where, oh, wow, things are not exactly as, as 3d as that we imagine them to be. Mm -hmm. And I also want to expand on that too, because, um, for anyone listening, it's, it's frustrating for, for you to hear like, oh, I'm, I'm curious about that. And now I'm like, okay, where do I start? What do I do? What's the training process? How do you become a certain level of initiate? And I feel like 
there's ways that several ways that you can do this, but what I found is helping people to really understand their nervous system. Because if you are super activated and you are hypersensitive to the stimuli around you and you end up continuing, continuing to be in a sympathetic dominant state, or you're more sensitive to that, you actually close off your ability to see lots of resources in your space. You get tunnel vision. It's the same reason why, like if a lion ran ran into the room and you'd feel scared, you would lose sight of like, okay, there's a door next to me. There's a window. You would just panic, right? And like you're moving very um, primally instinctually and you lose the ability to connect to higher levels of thinking. So helping people to just understand this baseline of how your nervous system is always trying to keep you safe and alive. Once you regulate that, you start to open up to see a lot more things in your day-to-day that you might not have been able to see before. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the nervous system is something that uh, there's so many people that are having a dysregulated nervous system. And even like, you know, when we get stressed, there's no way around it. Like, yeah, our limited thinking, our creativity kind of way, you're not thinking creatively and how to grow and expand when, you know, you're like nervous about something or like fearful or, you know, whatever it is. So how do we first create a practice in our life to start regulating the nervous system? Because that's really step one into getting to higher levels of awareness is to have that nervous system totally regulated and having the ability to regulate it yourself rather than from outside circumstances. Yeah. um, I think first and foremost is understanding what it is, because if you say the nervous system to people, uh, it seems, if you know about it, it seems really like inherent knowledge. Great. I'm going to continue to talk about it, but you might be missing where someone actually is and their understanding of what the system is. I went to medical school and I never learned about the complexity of the nervous system. It was always very like, this is just a system. There was not a lot of emphasis on that. And what I have found is that it's like the basis of health not like it is the basis of health because you're always operating based on if you think you're safe or not. If we take out all everything else, all the complexities of what people talk about in the healthcare space, it's like at a foundational level before anything else, your nervous system is conducting your instrument. Am I safe or not? And if it says I'm not safe, then you're pumping adrenaline and cortisol into your system, which starts to create discord in all body systems. So now you're an out of tune instrument, which then ripples into, you know, hormone issues, low libido, fatigue, GI issues, immune function issues, disconnection. So it's all the ripple effect of a dysregulated system. So describing that your nervous system is your alarm system. You have 40, roughly 40 miles of nerves within your whole system. So you have nerves that go all the way out to the tips of your fingertips, out to your toes, at the top of your head, they're all over. And the process of which they give you information to process and be able to decide, am I safe or not, is through your senses. So your senses give you information And then that information is processed through your nerves up to your spinal cord, to your brain for processing. And if you have a dysregulated system, you're lots of people are like not really uh, living in their body. Do you know what that, like you've probably seen people are just like very logical, very rational. They only ever think from their, you know, they're trying to rationalize through things, but they don't spend time like physically in their body feeling into the present moment, feeling connected to everything around them. So they're, they're like just disconnected from all of the information that is coming in, trying to give you um, information on if you're safe or not. And then the complexity of this is that lots of times what you're experiencing in the present moment is influenced by past experiences that you've had. So it might not be that you're not safe in this moment. It's your body saying, we've been here before. It's reminding us of this time when we were little, where we were unsafe. So it produces the same sort of outcome. So it's a confusing system if you don't know what it is. And if you're confused by it, then you'll constantly like not understand what you're experiencing in the present moment. 
Yeah. And you're experiencing the same things over and over physiologically and emotionally when, yeah, you're carrying all those ideas or beliefs from the past and then boom, all of a sudden it's a program. So you're running, you know, this, this software program is opening up as soon as, you know, X happens, Y will, will occur inside the body. It's like, um, it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like, you know, safety is the the first thing. And I think a lot of it has to do right now with, you know, it making the decision whether you're regulating your nervous system yourself through your own thoughts and yeah. decisions on how to get to your place. Like, you know, breath work is an amazing example of how to do that yourself and getting your to yourself of a parasympathetic state. Then the other aspect or is maybe like going on social media too much. Oh, did I get enough likes today? Did who watch my stories? All these kind of things. And then that reminds us, oh, I didn't have enough likes. This reminds me of this time when I was going through this. And there's so many different ways, you know, so all this external stimulus watching the news at night is going to put us into a sympathetic nervous system environment. So yeah, how do you control that? Do you wake up every single morning and look at your phone? Who texted me? Who emailed me? All this kind of stuff. Or are you go ahead and starting with the morning routine? So I think having the understanding of that, you have the ability to control your environment or reset at any moment it's super important. And I remember when we were on the, the cruise, you you brought us through a five senses exercise. So could you do that a little bit for us? Maybe you can walk us through it. Yeah. Um, and, and just to expand on that too, is like a big part of you being able to take response or to manage or navigate your nervous system is taking a hundred percent responsibility for yourself which is also hard because lots of people don't really want to take full responsibility for themselves. So they, you take full responsibility for what you're being exposed to that, you know, activates or deactivates your system. And one of the ways, one of the tools that you can use to help you say, I know in this moment I'm feeling activated or even just like to practice a skill to help you develop what peace and calm and safety feels like to your nervous system is a orientation exercise that you can do right? When you wake up, you can do when you're, you're sitting, talking on a zoom, like you can do it at any time. So what I'm going to have you do is just look where you're looking. If you're listening, if you're driving, look, uh, right straight ahead of you and just notice what you see in your environment. And then I want you to look and find something again, if you're driving, keep your eyes on the road, but <laughs> also see if you can see something in your peripheral or further down the road, or if you're just sitting, looking and listening, you're going to find something in your environment, either above you, below you, to the right or left, just letting your eyes go to that object and seeing this object in front of you. And notice that your eyes are like kind of going towards the object, right? You're like, okay, my vision, I'm going towards this object. And instead, I want you to picture that that object is coming to you. So it's starting to float to your eyes, or at least it's meeting you halfway. So you don't have to try so hard to look at this object anymore, because as you are looking at it, it is looking at you coming to your eyes. You can relax in receiving whatever you're looking at. It's coming to you. Just letting that kind of sit in your experience for a second. And now I want you to move to your auditory sense. So whatever you are listening to, find a predominant sound in your environment. And again, instead of your ears going to that object, that sound, that vibration, letting the vibration come to you. So again, you don't have to try so hard. It's coming to you, or at least it's meeting you halfway. You are in the mode of receptivity. You're showing your nervous system that you're safe in this moment. And the last one I'll have you do is just notice what you're sitting on. While you're sitting on something, notice that it's also holding you. It's supporting you. You can also do this exercise when you're eating something with the smell and the taste, but just a quick orientation exercise every day will help you get in touch with sight, auditory, and tactile. And that continues to remind your nervous system that you are in the present moment. You are grounded and you are safe in this specific moment. And that will help over time to help you continue to build your parasympathetic state so that you can always return to a sense of safety within yourself, even amongst the chaos that you experience. Wow. 
That was so beautiful. And just to do that in just a few minutes uh, on a daily basis to get us back into the present moment, you know, a couple of things that that went through my mind. First of all, when you said, don't try so hard, I was literally thinking of that, like not even a millisecond before you said it. It's like, why do you have to try so hard to look at something, just allow it to come in? So there's always a equal energy exchange in everything that we do, everything that we see. If we you know, are living in this holographic consciousness, yeah, like what I'm looking at is looking, you know, back at me. So it's like, don't think that, you know, you have to like always go ahead and like push forward and try to, you know, have that warrior energy and like, oh, okay, I'm going to look at this thing. No, what you look at, there's a, there's that energy exchange. So be okay with it. And being in that receiving energy also puts us into more of abundant state that, yeah, like this thing can come towards me. And I know like a lot of meditation work and going into the quantum field, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work is all about that is like, yeah, like don't, don't think about how to create these things in the 3D world, what you want to manifest, what you want to attract, get to a place of total like stillness. And that's where creation happens. You know, I talked to um, our friend Marnix about this the other day is, uh, you know, the Shiva and the Shakti energy is the Shiva energy burns everything to a crisp in order to have that potential to create anything again. So like the dance between the divine masculine and divine feminine. So there's this dance always going is going to be creation and destruction at all times. So when you go into that empty, empty place, that place is the potentiality for absolutely everything. So it's just this game that's going to continue on forever and ever and ever, you know, long after you know, our consciousness is in, is in, um, you know, any kind of existence, but yeah, this is, uh, this is beautiful and it's so powerful and yet so simple at the same time to, to be able to do these things, you know, just to get us back into that present moment, because that's the most important moment in the universe of all time is just right here, right now. For sure. How do you work with your clients? Um, and tell us a little bit about the, the Academy that you created. Um, so I first and foremost focus on individual development and understanding to know thyself at a really deep level. Um, so what that ever that looks like, if a couple couples come to me or just an individual, I work individually with them for four months as an intensive, teaching them lots of curriculum. Um, and then depending on if it's a couple, I see them once a month. So they'll each have their own sort of experience while bringing them together. Um, and then I have an opportunity to bring people through the ascension process to meet at an intimacy retreat. So that's going to be, that's going to be happening later this year. There'll be a singles opportunity. So it's like people who are in the space of doing the work, um, raising consciousness, creating the space for a divine partner. It's really hard to meet a divine partner on Hinge or Bumble or Tinder. I so, tried for years and it didn't happen. <laughs> my my partner ended up walking into my business. So that's how it happened. <laughs> that's amazing. But yeah, you have so, to be at the right place, right? You have to be individually, you have to be in the right space. Yes. So my hope is to uh, help people along a curriculum of understanding, just like the ancient Egyptians practiced this, like getting yourself to a certain point and then being in the space for um, facilitating a space for people to meet in a modern organic way. So it'll be like a singles retreat, um, to work on deepening intimacy and also meeting people and connecting to them in an organic way. And then a couple's retreat. So those are all on the books. And I also am, um, launching a group that will run several times throughout the year. Uh, it's nine weeks and it's to teach like a crash 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 course of um, emotional intelligence, nervous system regulation, and sacred intimacy principles. Beautiful. Um, And what are some of the biggest challenges that are facing your clients today? Um, I think the lack of prioritization on the internal transformation. I I think people still are in the mindset, like, I don't want to spend money on something I can't tangibly hold. Um, but really, truly the more that you transform internally, you start to project into your unified field, whatever it is that you want in this materialistic sort of confirmation. Um, and you, once you do the inner work, you have a greater appreciation for the things that you're physically manifesting, um, instead of the other way around. It's like, people are like, Oh, when I have this thing, it will bring me happiness, but it's always this like never ending pool, or you're always pushing the goalpost of, okay, now I have this thing. Now I want that thing. But until you really find out 
what you want and what fulfills you and what brings you happiness internally, you'll never see that projected outside of you. Amazing. And can you tell us a little bit about, obviously with no specifics, but what is your like favorite client experience and, you know, where they came to you and how they ended up like, you know, after working with you? My favorite experience, God, I've had so many. Um, One of them in particular that just popped up is I started treating a woman who was like on the verge of breaking up with her husband or ending the relationship. And they had a child together and she was just like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm not happy. And after working with her, she was like, it's all me. It's like all the stuff I'm projecting onto him. So once we healed that, she felt madly in love again with her partner and they ended up, uh, getting pregnant and very intentionally getting pregnant. The first one was an accident. And this one was like, no, we made a love child. So like just the opportunity for a child to be made purely from love intention and yeah, just that conscious choice to have him like, oh my gosh, she, she was just, I've worked with her you know, a year and a half ago and she still messages me with pictures or things that are still happening from doing this work. Yeah. It's like when we vacuum out all the things that are holding us back from our stories, then we could actually be like, oh, I have this new level of awareness. It's always ourself. There's yeah. never anything outside of ourself that we, you know, if we want change, it's, hey, look in the mirror, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and can we actually step into our full power without harnessing that dormant, like intimacy and sexual energy within us? Oh, that's a good question. Can we actually, I mean, I think life force energy is that sexual energy. And if you're not in tune with life force energy, I don't think that that is uh, connecting to your fullest potential. Beautiful. And as we close out, like, you know, I just want to, first of all, thank you so much for coming on. This is, this is absolutely incredible. And I think our audience are going to really learn a lot from this, but why do you think you came here to earth um, as Catherine Smilis? What did you want to experience? Um, So I'm a double cancer in my astrology chart. I don't put like a whole lot of emphasis on that, but I, the more that I have come back from Egypt, the more I recognize that I have the capacity to really feel a lot um, from other people. And, and I think like at a, at a global level, I can tap into like the pulse of what's happening at a macro scale or like this mass consciousness current level of emotion, which is sometimes painful, um, feel a lot, but I also think that it's beneficial to be able to have that perspective um, and then to step in as a leader and a guide and helping those who are curious just to find their way through this next phase of evolution in themselves and evolution in a, at a global level. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you know, the thing that I picked up about you just energetically is that you have such a strong presence and simply just being in a place raises the energy. I just noticed like you yeah, obviously when you when you talk to people conversations, everybody's very engaged, but you're able to really listen to somebody, be really present with them, and it's almost a transmission that you're you're offering to them. But even like when we were doing the um the ecstatic dance, like you were like in it and you were like keeping the energy up for everybody and like it was just really cool to to see that you know, you know, it's easy to just be like, okay, I'm just going to hang out, do my own thing. But you were really engaging people and, you know, it wasn't really your job to do so, but you know, that's the type of person that you are is like any place that you are, you're going to play full out. And that's what I, I really appreciate about you. And, you know, I'm trying to also do that myself a little bit more and play a little bit bigger role in every situation that I'm in. But uh, yeah, that's the one thing that I did notice about you. Thank you. That was so sweet. (laughs) Thank you for that reflection. (laughs) Of course, of course. I'm just a mirror, so I want you to be able to see it as well. And uh, what does God mean to you? And what do you think God is? Oh, wow. What a a way to close out this. (laughs) We don't play small here. (laughs) Casual, like, so, I mean, I think God is us. I like to view God as a source of, a source or universal frequency that we're all little pieces of. So I think God is creation and then creation is love. So um, yeah, God God is love being witnessed in like a physical form for us to experience through all of our senses. That's very powerful. (laughs) 
Catherine, thank you so much. How can we learn more about you and how can our audience get in touch with you if they if they want to work with you, which is a great freaking idea? Oh, thanks. Um, you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is intimacy underscore academy. Um, my website is on there too. It's inst- intimacyacademy.org. Uh, lots of opportunities on there. I have lots of free webinars and stuff that I do all the time. So just trying to create accessible um, knowledge for anyone at any level. And yeah, so you can find my email on there too, if you have any questions or DM me on Instagram. Wonderful. Yeah. Your, uh, your words are so full of wisdom and I really appreciate having you on here. So, uh, yeah, I think we're going to, you know, produce this thing and people are going to love to listen to it. Thank you. Thank you.